and Lucy can tell you a little bit more about herself uh, in her talk. Please give her a big welcome. Thanks, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I'm going to wait for the slides to come on. All right. Uh, so as Christian said, I'm Lucy Davis, and I work at Facebook as a design manager. Prior to Facebook, I spent about 10 years designing digital products and helping brands come to life. I've worked at design firms, primarily in a few agencies, um, and worked with clients who've run the gamut, from enterprise to consumer, businesses to organizations. But for the last two and a half years, I've been pretty deeply steeped in the world of display advertising. It's the longest I've ever spent focused on one industry, and it's actually been surprisingly fulfilling. We're at a really interesting point of advertising. It's an opportunity that comes along every so often in an industry where you can really disrupt the way that things have been working. For the last 50 years, things haven't changed that dramatically until recently. And we're now at the forefront of revolu revolutionizing how advertisers can get the right ads in front of the right people at the right time and allow businesses to measure success by the actual dollars that these ads bring in for them. And when this is done well, it means that advertisers like you and I are seeing ads that are meaningful to us and connecting us with content that provides us value. And when you're designing in an area like this, at a forefront of a changing industry, you actually have the opportunity to solve problems that have never been solved before. You get to develop products that we've never had the capabilities of building, and you get to design new UI patterns to solve these problems and help these products be successful. So today I wanted to talk about the future of advertising and where I'm seeing it going, some of the trends that are appearing, and the challenges of creating a personalized ad experience across the globe. So we'll look at these trends and how they're helping businesses and people connect. I'm sure everyone in this room is now pretty familiar that things are moving to mobile. But let's start by taking a step back. For a marketer, advertising is about two things. The first is capturing people's attention. And the second is telling a good story so people listen to what you have to say. But when you look at this image, it's clear this is no longer what the world is like. It looks more like this. The world is increasingly being experienced through a mobile device, and we see this all around us. When you look back to see what's happened in the history of communication channels, you'll see that mobile is the fastest adoption of disruptive technology in the history of human communication. It's pretty mind-blowing. So as an example, radio took 38 years to reach 50 million people. TV took 13 years to reach that same number, but mobile has taken only seven years to reach 1.4 billion people. And when you zoom in and take a look at what has happened with mobile recently, you'll find in addition to it expanding its reach in terms of the sheer number of people, mobile is the only channel where we're continuing to increase the time and attention we spend. Mobile now represents two out of three digital media minutes that we spend online. And mobile apps alone constitute the majority of this time. We've seen this at Facebook. So a couple years ago, we started to see that people were accessing Facebook on mobile more than they were on desktop. But the amazing thing was within one year, the number of minutes spent on Facebook mobile grew almost 90%. It went from 80 hours a month to 15 hours a month. And mobile is not just reaching more people here. The trend is global. It's happening across the entire world, not just in markets like the US. This is a visualization of the number of phones connected to mobile networks from 1992 to present day. Every single point of light on this globe is an individual human being. 
So what are these people doing on their phones? It's all kinds of things. Some people are using them to connect with their friends and family, and others are using them to run their business. This is not just a shift, it's a massive disruption. So given all these trends, what does this mean for us as marketers and designers? Step one is rethinking, where do we find our audiences? And while that may seem like an obvious question, our advertising industry is still catching up in a lot of ways. For example, when purchasing media, consumer media, advertisers currently spend 11 cents on mobile for every 99 cents spent on print. Of course, some marketers are catching up, and those who are spending their budgets to reach audiences on mobile have learned that people's intention on mobile is a lot more centralized than it was in web. Much of the app usage on the phone is limited to the top six to eight apps. So marketers are finding that their audience on Facebook, their, that their audiences are on Facebook, YouTube, Google, search, Twitter, a pretty small group. So in, in addition to rethinking where to find their audiences, businesses also have to develop a stronger mobile presence so they can be found. With people spending more time on mobile, the expectation that services and information are going to be available at our fingertips has come to be a standard. And we also expect responsiveness and quick, mess quick replies from messages and requests. Facebook is trying to make this easier for businesses through a pages platform which helps you build a free online presence. Recently, we've been focusing on adding new functionality that helps small and medium-sized businesses represent themselves online. On the left, or sorry, on the right here, is an example of a really large call to action that we're allowing advertisers and businesses to leverage to give their customers the ability to connect with them quickly. So in this case, you can click this button and call the business with one click. You can also further explore a whole list of services that the business has to offer with one more click to see this menu on the left. Pages has also been exploring more private forms of communication that are accessible within a private thread. This screen shows how a business owner of a, or an admin of a page can respond privately to a customer through a one-on-one -on -one message link. Iterating, integrating this type of messaging can be very helpful in cases which require sensitive user info, like an account password, account number, or billing ID. We're also seeing businesses like Squarespace and Wix give businesses the ability to create a beautiful mobile experience without much work. And Google is doing a lot to help tie your business presence to the ability to take real actions on mobile. In the screens above, you can imagine that someone looks for a hotel via Google search. Once they find the one they like, they can book the room directly from the ad unit. This allows for a seamless experience from search to discovery and then purchase all on your mobile device. In addition to adapting to the rise of mobile, another critical lesson we've been learning at Facebook is that we are marketing to a really diverse world. Deloitte reported in 2014 that Facebook enabled $227 billion of economic impact and 4.5 million jobs globally. This is pretty astounding. It's the kind of economic impact that we're really excited about, particularly since a large portion of this is in our emerging markets, where this growth is sorely needed. We're learning and continuing to grow. As we're learning and continuing to grow, we must design for people who are, and, <coughs> excuse me, we, we must design for people for the context that they're in. We have to consider the devices they use, the connection speeds they're on, and the cost of data in their region. So raise your hand here if you use an iPhone. All right, that's like a good at least 75% of the room. So it's really easy to forget that this is what 
Facebook, YouTube, Google looks like for most of the people around the world. About 58% of our mobile users worldwide are using phones like these. So understanding how to design effectively for these devices is critical. This is a visualization of Facebook connection data worldwide. So what you'll see here is that the 4G connections in Facebook, to Facebook are in yellow. This is mostly in the US, Northern Europe, Japan, South Korea. The 3G connections are in blue. And you'll see in red the areas where 2G is the norm. So 2G is extraordinarily slow. To put this into context, it can take two minutes to download a single web page on 2G. Ouch. But every constraint, as we all know, including connectivity, can pose an interesting creative challenge. And it can sometimes lead to the most innovative solutions. Everybody wants to tap into the mobile video trend that's happening these days. But the problem is, this won't necessarily produce the same experience for everyone because their connectivity is different. So at Facebook, we realized that small and medium businesses and emerging markets need an easier, cost-effective way to create video assets that are lighter. Out of this came our solution, which is called Slideshow. With Slideshow, advertisers can create a lightweight version of a video ad just by using still images and stringing them together. These photos can be taken from an existing video or even stock images that we have available through Facebook. And the format uses dramatically less bandwidth than a traditional video. So this is an example of the workflow that an advertiser would go through to be able to build a slideshow ad. So this would be leveraging our Facebook video library, selecting the images to create a story, and then the result is a string of images that come together as if they were a video. The cost of data is also a barrier for many people around the world. These communities are very price conscious and hyper aware of their data usage. They find all kinds of ways to minimize the impact of their phone usage on their data plans and how they can reduce the costs. So we've been observing a really fascinating hack that many communities around the world have developed using missed calls as a form of communication. This means someone will place a call and hang up before they're charged. In Syria, five missed calls in rapid succession means, I'm online, let's chat. In Bhutan, farmers know how much milk that a customer wants by the number of missed calls that they get. And in India, a missed call from a shop or business means your order is ready. So as marketers, we can learn to leverage these hacks and help connect people with businesses. In observing this behavior, we developed an ad format around the missed call phenomenon. It allows consumers to avoid the data fees and allow them to still connect with the business by messaging or texting, having that, best, that business message them or text them back with no charges. So you'll see here this missed call button Click the button and your phone calls the number and it immediately hangs up. Then the business you're looking to connect with will get in touch with you. This helps consumers manage their data costs and they're able to access relevant content from the businesses who want to connect with them. So if we're going to build a new mobile economy at scale, we need a design for the people where they are. And that includes taking into account devices, slow network connections, the cost of data, and the inspiring hacks to work around it all. The next area I wanted to tell you guys about is the trend around getting advertising to be more personal. And this is a pretty loaded statement. It can mean a lot of things. It can mean creating great experiences that are delightful and useful. And it can also feel downright creepy. So 
with this, we have a ton of potential to provide content that's meaningful, but we need to do it in the right way. So out of the group here, raise your hand if you've ever been shopping on a website and looked at a product, such as a new pair of shoes, and then went to another site like Facebook or even the New York Times and saw an ad for that product you were just looking for. Okay, so good, good maybe 60% of the room. So how many of you who have had this experience have found the ad to be useful? A few, all right. <laughs> and how many of you were a little creeped out by it? All right, a few more. So that's about what I expected. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity here to connect with people, but in many aspects, we clearly have a long way to go. When this is done right, though, this experience can be delightful, and at a minimum, at least useful. So this is an ad that I saw recently, and it's um, from a business called Yoga Glow. I practice yoga, it makes me happy. But I also travel a lot, and I don't have a lot of time to go to the local studio. So I was on this site recently, looking up their classes, but then I got distracted. It was in the middle of the day, walked away from it. A few days later, this ad popped up in my Facebook feed, and it was a great reminder of this thing that I was trying to do for myself, and now the opportunity to do it with two weeks free. I found that to be a really useful experience that I welcomed in my feed. But you can see that these things need to be done really carefully. Another example of content that feels personal to me is this Banana Republic ad on Pinterest. So as a designer, I love collecting images that inspire me. And Pinterest has now developed a pretty good amount of data on my tastes and my interests. And when they're able to map my interests with their ad content, the results are really great. The ad surfaces products that are of interest to me. I actually, this would be an outfit I would wear. And it fits seamlessly into my well-curated feed that I'm pretty protective over. In addition to advertisers being thoughtful about how they take my interests into account, personalized advertising should also mean showing me the right information at the right time. So Phil's Coffee, which is in this ad here, is a local coffee company. And we have a location on our campus at Facebook. So last week, I came in, sat down at my desk, opened Facebook, and this ad popped up. Phil's Coffee is about a quarter, less than a quarter mile away. And it takes me five minutes to walk. And here was an ad for that business at the right time of the day in the morning when I was really ready for one of those teas with the nice mint in them. So the beauty of these location ads is that Phil now has, Phil's now has the opportunity to connect with me while I'm at work and show me this ad for the Facebook location. But they can also connect with someone in Noe Valley or the mission and connect them to their local business. These, by connecting people to their specific locations, we're able to help the business find the people who are going to find this ad most useful and are most likely to engage. The next question that we have to answer is how do we make these kinds of pretty smart ads that make advertising relevant and valuable, accessible to advertisers of all sizes, including businesses like Bill's, or maybe even smaller businesses, say a taco shop or a local plumber. The majority so this is one of the really majorly complex areas Facebook design team has been exploring. We've approached this problem by developing simple mobile flows to help smaller businesses get started, like these. And for other advertisers who are looking for much more complex features and many options for how they connect with their audience, you'll see that we provide a whole slew of options with the goal of helping advertisers get the right ad with meaning the content or in front of the right people at the right time. And this relates to one of my personal goals in working, on, working at Facebook in advertising. It's to make Facebook experience feel more meaningful with ads than without them. But that sets a pretty high bar. And like most things, with this great opportunity that we have, comes a really important responsibility. We believe at Facebook that we should be setting a precedent by providing people with transparency and control over how they're being marketed to. Our ads preferences work is industry leading in terms of 
the control it gives people to affect the ways in which they're being targeted in our ad system. It allows you to control the information about you to decide which ads we're actually going to show you. So this is an example of what my personal ads preferences look like. You can see we can expand fitness and wellness and see all the associated preferences. So we're going to check out the cycling one. I mountain bike occasionally, but I would not consider myself a cyclist. So I'm going to opt out of cycling as a preference. All I have to do is click on the row, and I'll get a confirmation that I'll no longer be shown ads based on my preference for cycling. So now that we've explored getting content to people that is relevant and useful, let's talk about how we can use ad formats to capture people's attention and imagination. And this is where it can really get fun. So how many people have seen an ad like this? Eh, not as many as I would thought. It may also be somewhat, somewhat like Stockholm Syndrome, you <laughs> know, getting, getting used to it. Um, so this is how, up until recently, I think we've been seeing immersive ads. And they're immersive, as in they take over the page, they're pretty in your face, and they also feel pretty disruptive. So this ad, for instance, succeeds in catching our attention everywhere, uh, but it also distracts us from everything else on the page. And the message that oatmeal is great for weight control doesn't quite feel congruous with an article about how great it is that Amy Schumer feels comfortable in her body, just as it is. There are better ways we're starting to see ads incorporated as native content. By bringing in ad content in a way that feels that it's presented to you like other content on the platform. So this is an example of a Cole Haan collaboration with a site called Mike.com. This is a news destination that believes young people deserve quality news coverage that's tailored to them. The beauty of this Cole Haan ad, or experience I should say, is that it feels like it belongs without hiding the fact that it's marketing. It says it's sponsored by Cole Haan. The content is interesting and it's relevant. It's targeted to young women who are the audience for this site. And it's executed at a level of quality that matches the publication. Who's familiar with Snapchat? A few folks. All right. So for those who aren't familiar, Snapchat is an ephemeral messaging platform. They get about 6 billion video views a day. And more than half of the user base is under 24. So this experience is actually feels pretty experimental. It's really about exploration. I got totally lost the first few times I used it. Um, but it starts to bring you in. And they have this experience called Discover at the top. It's, an it's a really interesting example of giving third-party content a place to seamlessly live in this experience. The Discover area allows content providers, like Britain Co., which is on the far left, which is a community for creatives, to live front and center so people can find this content and explore and engage with it like they do the rest of the app. So here's an example. It also allows Brit & Co. to share this space with brands that advertise with them. So while swiping through, I came across this Google ad. And this is an interesting example of a well-executed, native, and immersive feeling experience. It's developed with this full screen, vertical format that's really distinct to Snapchat. And it plays perfectly to this Brit & Co. audience of crafters and makers. It's catchy, it's not overproduced, and that's, those are also signature elements of Snapchat. It's about quickly capturing content. So I thought I'd also show you a couple examples of how we're approaching immersive ads at Facebook. These are innovations around how we can take editorial feeling content and shopping ads and start to lead the way for how to make these experiences even more engaging. And they give us an opportunity to connect people and businesses in a deeper way. This is an example of a format called Canvas that we're currently testing. So once a person clicks on the ad, it expands and brings them into this visually engaging and interactive experience.
We partnered with Burberry to show what this could mean for the future of e-commerce on Facebook. As you'll see, this format is really able to capture the beauty and the tactile quality of the scarves as they kind of flow. And they're able to bring them into life. It also lets you explore this world of Burberry. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't mind one of those scarves. <laughs> And this now brings us to the future. So we've talked about how quickly the industry is evolving and that we're seeing huge strides in mobile, our ability to reach people, and even integrate video. But it's really exciting to think of what may be ahead. As virtual reality advances and becomes more accessible, advertising has the potential to change again what it means to connect with people, people with brands. This is when I wish I had funny goggles to give all you guys to experience yourselves. Um, but I'm just going to have to talk us through what this could mean. So it could mean unlocking really new and interesting opportunities. For instance, it could mean getting the experience of driving in a luxury car along a stunning California coast. And as you look around the car, you're able to see all the beautiful features and details. Or how about when you're planning your next vacation and you're transported to this world of the four seasons in Bora Bora. You look around this incredible setting and you can take a peek into these luxurious thatched rooms. You may even be able to experience what's happening below the surface and get a glimpse of the world of snorkeling with sharks. And for those of you who are fashion lovers, this could mean attending one of Chanel's fabulously creative shows. This would bring a whole new dimension to having access to the latest line the moment it debuts. So I'm personally excited to see where we go from here and to be part of a team who's taking on the challenge of connecting people and businesses in meaningful and engaging ways. Thank you. And we're going to now open it up to questions. Talk. Um, so you said that one of the, the standards is to make sure that the experience with these immersive ads actually is better. And I was wondering, uh, what do you guys do to make sure that it's better? I mean, and, and not in terms of like putting the quality in, but assessing whether that quality was experienced. Because I did once have an experience with a Facebook ad that was life changing. And I had another time that was really comical. And <laughs> then I, I can't think of any others. So what do you guys do to measure quality of experience? There are a few things. To start with, when an advertiser comes to Facebook, one of the first questions we pose to them is, what are you trying to do by coming here? And we try to map their experience starting at that point. So if you're coming here to get people to visit your website, we're going to measure the success based on clicks to your website. If you're coming here to try to sell a product online, then what we would like to do is try to help you really understand how many people are buying that product and what is the return on investment of the ad spend that you had on Facebook. We also can measure time for brand advertisers who actually may not have a call to action, but they really just want to tell a story and have people connect. For instance, the Burberry ad might be a good example. We can measure the time that people spend engaging with it in comparison to other content on Facebook as a relative comparison. Uh, with so many ad formats that you have in Facebook, how do you measure the pace to push out new content to brand new advertisers? For example, if I'm a traditional search advertiser, how do you I don't know, how do you properly pace your, the, 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 the tempo, I guess, to push out new, different format of um, display ads? That's a great question. Um, it usually involves a lot of testing and research with our advertisers. Um, we'll tend to, like the immersive ads right now are, are more experimental, so we'll work with a handful of partners. Um, Michael Kors and Burberry have been, are usually game to do some experiments with us and excited to see what we're coming out with. Um, so we'll run tests with them and see how, that's, how things are going before we roll it out more broadly. Um, so really, most of it comes down to, to research and tracking 
um, the success of the ads. But one of the big challenges is how do we continue to scale a system that works for so many different formats and can serve many different verticals? And that's a problem we're constantly coming across. And I think we're sort of solving it one step at a time. Um, but it sometimes then means taking a step back and rethinking how our, how our system is structured so that it can continue to scale and get the right people to the right content. Here, can you say something about your team? And you know who's who's on the team. You work with advertisers coming in. You work with developers, and I mean, I'm just guessing. So you can, yeah. How big is it, and what do they do, and like that? Sure. So I can start at the top. We have um, four, five major product areas, including Instagram and Facebook, and one of them is ads and pages. So since I joined Facebook two and a half years ago, that's the kind of the world at Facebook that I've lived within. And then within ads and pages, we have five key areas, and I lead design for one of those areas and we call it Ad Solutions. And the goal of my team is to understand the needs and the behaviors of groups of advertisers, such as smaller businesses, or e-commerce, e direct response advertisers, brand advertisers, emerging markets. And then look at our system from their perspective. So what are all the products that they engage with? What are their workflows? What are their behaviors on Facebook and off Facebook? What are they looking to achieve? Where are we doing really well at that? And where do we have some areas that we really can improve for them? And then what are the new products that we can provide to help them achieve the goals that they can't achieve today? And then I guess to your to question about who we work with, um, our design team is we have design, product designers who tend to be end-to-end, -end, kind of hybrid designers, UX down to the details of the visual design and implementation. We work really closely with researchers, and one of ours is here today, Paula. Uh, as well as content strategists. And then we work with our product managers, product marketing managers, engineers. We have some design program managers, technical program managers, depending on the team, um, and probably missing a, a role or two, but I think that starts to paint the picture. They're pretty collaborative and interdisciplinary teams. When you come in to work today, how many people are, is it like, 50 people in a room, or are you like 10 people in a room, or what do you? Yeah, our okay. layouts are really open. Um, but I think that's a, a pretty popular thing you see right now um, in many office spaces where even our highest level executives don't have an office. Um, so we'll you'll walk in and see a floor of desks all around, lots of posters. We, we screen print them on campus, which is pretty fun as a designer to go get your hands dirty with ink. Um, and we have a pretty, uh, defined aesthetic, I would say. It's this kind of like raw, concrete um, wood, plywood, and, and the kind of white that then gets covered with art and, and posters. Um, but as far as kind of how we're organized, our team just kind of spreads out. There's like the designers and the uh, engineers and the PMs that we work with kind of all around a big area. Ah, that? Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, the question was, what's a typical day like? Um, so I started out as, uh, as an individual contributor when I joined the team, and now I'm, I'm managing a pretty large team. So my day-to-days have changed. Um, for an individual contributor, um, it, it probably is a combination of having some hours, hopefully, to get some work done and, and do your design work. Um, with uh, We do critiques once a week with the team. We have you know, t different team check-ins, so you'll be checking in with the engineers and the PM that you work with on the project. Um, it could mean doing research if we're at that phase of the project and getting to meet with advertisers or sit, n sit in and observe usability sessions. Um, one of the cultural things that we try to adhere to is having Wednesdays um, as a day with no meetings, and then for people who tend to commute far, they can work from home. Um, my days now tend to be lots of meetings, <laughs> so they're a little bit different than they used to be. You have a question here. Uh, you spoke a lot about the content, different type of art, different way to, to, to send the art. What about the targeting? What way Facebook, somebody want to advertise in Facebook, how we can target better to be more precise to, to the right crowd that you want to, to get? Yeah, targeting is a really interesting and really complex area. Um, there are, I, I showed that one area, and I don't, I'm afraid it might have been too small, the 
screen um, with our more complete targeting UI, um, but there's the ability to target by geography, like the local ads. Um, you can target by different demographic info. You can target by behaviors and interests. Um, you can get into more time-based uh, delivery as well. So you can say that you want an ad to only run through certain hours of certain days. Um, you can get really pretty granular in the control. So I think our, one of our challenges is actually distilling some of those options down so that people don't get overwhelmed and trying to help people understand how to best utilize those targeting options um, so there isn't this like paralysis of like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, and that's something that we're still, I think, still working through, especially our teams that focus on smaller to medium-sized businesses. A big piece of what they're doing is trying to understand what's that right level of targeting control to give people um, so that they feel like they can learn what they're here to do pretty quickly um, without getting too bogged down in all the options. What about targeting to businesses, like B2B instead of B2C? Uh, targeting to businesses based on the like job function or position in the company or skills, that type of skills that person has or something that is more meaningful for businesses. Yeah, so say it's um, a company, yeah, you, your example is a company that's trying to um, hire. So what they could do is actually probably target to the individuals who they're looking to hire um, based on those people's uh, interests or behaviors. Um, you can target based on education level. Um, so areas like that would help get you to the right people, get your message to the right people. Uh, you mentioned that uh, if I'm a business, I can choose between different demographics and things like that. Uh, what's the extent that Facebook intelligently can choose all that stuff for me, depending on the industry or type of product that I'm looking to sell? Um, so as a business, it's mostly, I think, the way that I think about it is that we're giving you guys all, all the control up front, mm -hmm. and then it's our job to understand how people have engaged. So as a user on Facebook, how I've engaged with ad content, um, what, what I've shown some signal I favor or I respond well to, and what I don't. And then our job is to match that content across the two. Okay, and that, that actually leads to my next question where, um, is Facebook like behind the scenes maybe intelligently uh, knowing that maybe when the phone is in a certain position, like someone sitting on the couch, that certain ads are more successful or if a person has just been walking and they stop for a certain period of time or they've just been in a car driving 60 miles an hour and then they stop. As, do you know if there's anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's getting really creative. Yeah, not, not, that I, not that I know of. Okay. Um, so I think location, so taking someone's location into account, um, is probably as close as we get to that today. Okay. But in general, I think that's a really, you know, outside of advertising, I think that's a really interesting area yeah. of where mobile and digital experiences are able to take us. Yeah, um, okay, thanks. Do you target by day parts? Yeah, we can do day parting. Um, uh, is that what you yeah, were yeah, asking about? Yeah, I also yeah. want to ask another question, which was, um, do you have ways to help guide people towards a better, like, like however they set things up in the configuration, can they run tests or experiments and kind of, you know, gravitate towards a better arrangement uh, through your interface? Yeah, we don't, um, I don't believe at this point we support like official A-B testing and setting up those experiments um, so people can kind of on their own try to play with different things. But probably the most impactful thing that we're trying to do is once we ask you, what is that thing you're here to do? What are you trying to accomplish by advertising on Facebook? We can then change your workflow to surface the right things for you that we think are gonna help you be successful rather than giving you every option. Let's give you this, this um, shorter list of options. We also can optimize delivery based on the actions that we're trying to get someone to take with your ad, um, which maps back to your goal. Um, and that, I think, to an earlier question, that's something where we do have um, control and we can say, if you're looking to um, get clicks on your ad to lead to your website, and uh, we, can, we have a delivery system that's called um, optimized uh, you know, cost per click. 
and that's what we would do, which is really meaning we're going to try to use the intelligence of our delivery system to get you the best possible rate for each of those clicks while getting this ad to the people we actually believe are going to click on it. Sorry, it's me again. So uh, I do notice that Facebook has a power editor, yeah. which I assume that it's targeting towards more bigger advertisers yes. with a lot of bulk actions. But I do see that nowadays in the UI version, the website version, you're exposing a lot of bulk actions there as well. So what's the rationale behind that? And what's currently the difference between, in your mind, between the users who are using the power editors and the one who are using the website? Yeah, you, you know your stuff. Um, <laughs> so you were exactly right that Power Editor um, evolved from uh, an early experiment that we did to try to help advertisers. So uh, years ago, we were noticing that there are advertisers who are managing lots of things, like lots of ads in our system. And we wanted to give them a tool to make that easier. And that's how Power Editor came to be. It's still, uh, I, I think that um, it's still a tool very much oriented towards helping people manage lots of things. Um, but as we've evolved Ads Manager, we found that there is kind of some middle ground. Ads Manager. We have, we have an experience called lightweight interfaces, which is for smaller businesses that make it really easy, um, or hopefully that's our goal, to advertise. Then there's Ads Manager, which is probably for the bulk of businesses who still may need to take some actions, like some bulk editing. And then we have Power Editor, which is for those guys who are probably professional marketers and may spend hours a day in the experience. We'll also tend to roll out some of our most advanced features in Power Editor first, um, because those are the advertisers who are looking for them initially. Hi, so I have a question. Uh, you introduced a lot of like different ad formats and uh, like uh, rep um, presentation, uh, different way to present them. So among like so many ways uh, of ads, uh, which one is the best? Uh, you know. Uh, you've seen so far, like relatively, uh, I'm I'm sure it's like uh, case by case, but like you know, maybe in Bay Area, what's what's the best ad format? Um, yeah, can you disclose? It Thank definitely you. is a case by case type basis. I mean, I can tell you about like what I personally get excited about, but that's also me coming to the table as a designer and liking very highly visual and engaging content. Um, but I do think I think the beauty is figuring out the right content for the right people that serves the advertiser's needs, um, which is why it's, it is so contextual. Um, and we are continuing to explore different formats. So for instance, an advertiser who's trying to um, sell products online, we now have a product or a format that we call Carousel. So you can actually swipe through multiple products um, and not just have to stick with the first one you see. Uh, that can be extensible too to brand advertisers who may want to string together multiple images to tell a story in a sequence. Um, so it's also interesting to see how people kind of take a format that's intended for one reason um, and you know, like most systems, adapt it in creative ways um, and then can, we can actually take that as a cue and continue to evolve the format to serve that new purpose. So, uh, sorry, based on my personal experience, like the when mostly catch my attention is my friends like something. But sometimes they, they like Comcast, so I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, sometimes I don't believe my friend really liked that thing, or they may did it by mistake. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> they may have done it by mistake, yeah. but, um, but we wouldn't misrepresent that okay. they, okay. That they so had clicked on it. So I'm almost getting this impression that you know people goof off from work or whatever. They go look at Facebook. You know they they need a break from work, so they pull up Facebook. They start reading it. Then Facebook gets kind of heavy with social obligations and stuff, so they can escape into the ad experience and 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 even goof off from Facebook by by playing around with cool ads. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting model. Um, looks like maybe we've got time for one. Right. Um, your goal is very impressive to make the experience better with advertising. Uh, I guess my question is, is that actually possible and, and how, how do you know that you've, you've got a better experience with ads than, than without? That's a really good question, the how. I do believe it's possible. I think it's a really challenging and lofty goal. I think having challenging and lofty goals are great. I think they are motivating. Um, and I do think that is the North Star that we should be moving towards. I think the more ads and more diversity of ads we have in our system will allow us to get closer to that goal. Um, we have 
We support a multitude of businesses, and I think one of the really important things about being able to support smaller businesses, um, all the work that we're doing in emerging markets, is that we're creating a much more diverse ecosystem of content so that we really can connect content that's meaningful to you as an individual. Um, I think that I would love to come back here in not too long and ask people who has seen a retargeted ad, so an ad where you saw a product and then it showed up, and have people no longer feel like it's creepy. I want people to feel like it was really useful. Um, you're like, wow, that was just what I needed, thanks. <laughs> um, rather than like, hmm, how did you know that that was <laughs> what I was looking at? Um, so you know, we do have a long way to go, but I think sentiment and I think engagement are gonna start to help us understand if we're on the right path. Do you think you've, you're close to break even? Like a as good experience with an ad as without? I don't know, what do you guys think? No. I'm Tough crowd. No. All right. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that we have tried to um, adhere to is to not create ad formats that are completely unique of the um, organic content that we allow people to create. So what I mean by that is, for instance, the immersive ad where it takes over the whole page. We have a parallel um, product that people can use called Instant Ads that takes over the page as well and creates a really nice immersive reading experience. Um, Facebook video was something that we were developing for advertisers but didn't feel comfortable launching until we had a great video solution for the people who use Facebook as consumers. Um, and so I think that, that that's a really important thing that we've, we've really stuck to, um, even when it means we could have released an advertising product sooner. Um, but I think that that helps kind of keep the content um, true to the Facebook format as well. A couple of thoughts were bouncing around in my head around uh, some of the stuff you were talking about. One was um, how to sort of improve that, uh, create that better experience, right? And, and so the hinge is on how you define better, right? A and one of the things, so that's one primary question is really like how do you think about how it could be better? Like what are some dimensions around that? And then in terms of like engaging, just the term engaging, right? Advertising is in some frames, frames of mind, Advertising is sort of inherently a distraction. You're doing something and advertising's mission is to try, is to try and get you to do something else. Um, how does that, how can you make, how can you fit that in and this notion of better together? Yeah, um, so I'll answer kind of the second part first. I think it, Examples like that, Mike.com, where you're bringing in Kohan, or an example actually I didn't show, but um, Orange is the New Black partnered with the New York Times, and it was really incredible experience. The experience itself was beautifully designed and really engaging, but they had um, people go out and learn about um, challenges for women in prisons. Um, and they did it in a journalistic way, and they captured this really cool story on New York Times. Um, but it tied, it was sponsored by, uh, by the TV show uh, when it was releasing the second season. And that's the kind of thing where I feel like you're actually like, connecting with the content. Like, yes, it relates to Orange is the New Black, and you'll probably, that will stick in your head. It, it's good brand advertising. Um, but it's also something that where you're learning from credible content. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting dynamic where it's not just a distraction. Um, it's actually something that, that provides value. So for someone who's curious and wants to be learning, that's the value that they're getting. For someone who's looking to save money and seeing something that they're interested in buying that is now on sale, like that's also hopefully not too much of a distraction because it's something that you're wanting to engage in. Um, so I think, it's, I think that that contextual element is, is really important, but there's many, many ways of trying to do that. Will you repeat the first question? Oh, like what? The, fir the first, th Perfect. that actually, I think your answer touches on, okay. on that first question. The first question is really like how, how, how you can think of better in terms of improving the experience, you know, the ad experience, or the experience of Facebook with ads being somehow better than the Facebook experience without ads. And I think that's part of it, at least. 
Yeah, I think it really is the kind of, I've been using the word value or the, the meaning, um, but when you see an ad and you get something from it, um, and that could be delight too. Like I get, um, I get newsletters from or an ads through my email for Patagonia, and it's a brand that I love. Like I really think that the, um, they stand for really cool things, and they've been really true um, to what they stand for. And that shows up when they send out the email on Black Friday, and they say, like one year it was like, don't buy anything, go and enjoy what you have, and this year it was go repair that thing that you've been using. Like you can bring it to our store, and it was really great. They said like you're in California. Go, you can go to this store and bring in your jacket and we will be able to repair it for you there. Like That's a pretty cool experience and it feels really authentic to who they are. Um, and for me, like that, that's meaningful and that has a connection to something that I believe in. Um, so we talk about ads and businesses, but this is also can be nonprofits, organizations, like there's a whole gamut. Or if you think about like the new business that's opening on your block, like that doesn't feel the same as when some big box company is marketing to you. Um, so it's us better targeting those ads to you based on those things that resonate. So you mentioned uh, some data that you have um, to serve more relevant ads such as demographics, interests, um, you have a social graph. Uh, one of the benefits of search ads is intent. So mm -hmm. when somebody types in a search query, you have a better idea of what they're interested in at that particular time. Uh, what type of signals does Facebook have to uh, draw off of that? Because I'm assuming if somebody's on Facebook, they're on Facebook and they're using Facebook. Um, so are, is there anything else that you know um, from what people are doing while they're on Facebook that would signal what their intent is at that time? Um, yeah, I think intent is interesting. It's like a, it's a kind of whole different, um, kind of different approach. There are, there are a couple of things. Um, there's the ads preferences, which I was showing you, which actually each person, it's a really interesting exercise to see like, oh yeah, what are the preferences that you have down for me? Um, and that can help us connect content to the right person. Um, it also, there was something else I was going to say and I'm forgetting late on, <laughs> on Tuesday night. Um, I think it'll come back to me and I'll finish your <laughs> question. Um, oh, actually, I think wh what I was going to say is that one of the ways that we also allow advertisers to target their ads is um, based on an engagement that you may have had with their brand in the past or with their, their um, site or app off of Facebook. So that's a way where we have a signal that this is something that you have some interest in or perhaps you already bought a product and now we can, this company wants to market you something that's actually related that we, they think you're gonna find of value. Um, so intent, it's, it's not search intent, but there is intent from other signals that we're able to take from advertisers um, and help, use, help them leverage that to get the content to the right people. So I, I was just saying, uh, so if I p post something on my timeline uh, as a status, so I don't have to worry about uh, the ads are following me, right? I don't believe that we <laughs> would uh, scan your status for a signal for how to uh, market ads to, towards you, not as far as I understand. <laughs> um, so were you, or was your team able to, uh, let's see, was your team able to determine that there were different user goals depending on <clears throat> if the person was using like a desktop computer or smartphone? Kind of like in that moment, what is someone trying to accomplish who's a, an advertising user? And if you did notice differences in <clears throat> the intentions within a session, were there certain things that you, or a certain emphasis that you prioritize differently on mobile as opposed to like desktop? And you mean for advertisers yeah. who are using our platform? Yeah, yeah there are. <clears throat> um, so uh, we have a product called Ads Manager app, um, and that product is actually quite 
quite pared down. Um, and what we did is we said, when we, de when we release this, this is really going to be for a specific group initially, which is for smaller businesses who are likely, who don't have hours a day to be on their laptop or even maybe even a half an hour a day to be on their laptop. They're going to have 15 minutes while waiting for delivery or waiting to pick up their kid at school. Um, so let's give them an opportunity to create ads and manage their ads, see how they're performing um, from mobile. So what we did is we looked at the top things that people were trying to do with advertising on Facebook, which we call objectives, what's the objective of the advertiser, and we took the top three, and that's what we released in the, in the mobile app. Now I think it may be four or five, we've gradually been adding a few additional ones that we feel like have especially applicable use cases for these smaller businesses. Um, we also, we have um, an object model uh, that works pretty well for our large advertisers. You can have a, a campaign, and then the campaign can have a group of ads called an ad set. They can have the same targeting information, they have the same budget, and then you have individual ads that have different creative and messages. All of that is really great if you are used to living in a world like that and managing larger campaigns. It can be pretty confusing if you're somebody who just wants to figure out how to get an ad on Facebook. So we also tried with the mobile app to try to take that out of the experience initially and then fold it in in a thoughtful way so people can orient themselves when they move to different experiences, but don't burden them to figure that out from the get-go. Um, so there were simplifications like that along the way. Didn't allow all of the targeting that we would um, on desktop, on mobile, to keep that experience simpler. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and just one question about the objectives. Did you get those objectives by looking at like the analytics or was that more of like the user research um, That was analytics. I think that was, we did both. There was a fair amount of user research. Um, okay. And the mobile app was actually a really interesting, uh, I think, use case in building a product. It came out of our ads growth team. It was something that we had a hunch we should build. Um, so the ads growth team works within sprints and they said we're going to dedicate a 12 week sprint to try to Build, they built a prototype of it that we tested, and then they built a version that we just put into our, our online mobile Facebook experience. And what we found is, I, I don't quote me on this, but I think it was over six months, 70% of our advertisers visited that. We didn't wait six months. We started to move ahead um, and build an actual native experience that you could download and get notifications from. Um, but we, we worked in this really quick, iterative way, which is like 12 weeks of prototyping and then 12 weeks uh, you know, designing, prototyping, 12 weeks of building, and then releasing this out into the world in a limited function. You couldn't create ads, but we could see who was interested in looking at their ads performance and making some modifications um, through this mobile experience, which gave us great signal as we started to create the native experiences. Okay, thanks. Is that it? Everyone ready to go home? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.